Hey everyone, it's Mr. Ray here with our next lesson in grade 11 university math. We're working in the exponential functions unit and today uh, we're going to go through the last lesson which is the are the applications of exponential functions and there's quite a few real life situations that have um, a model that uh, uses an exponential function. So, um, just a reminder, an exponential function always looks, well it starts off with y equals uh, b to the power of x. b is a base. Uh, that's base, that's the number that you're multiplying multiple times over and over. x is the exponent and that that's what makes, uh, if you're wondering whether um, your function is exponential, if the if the variable x is in the exponent, well, that makes it an exponential function. Okay, um, and unlike a lot of other base functions, uh, exponential functions have uh, many base functions because for every value of b, uh, it has its own base graph. Okay, so y equals 2 to the x would be a base graph, and y equals 5 to the x, etc y equals 1.02, the x, there's infinite numbers of bases. Now, the only bases, well, the, the only um, bases that are allowable, uh, well, the first thing is it has to be a positive number, and it can't be 1. Okay, so anything bigger than 0, but not 1, is a valid base. Okay, now, uh, within those different bases, um, we break that down into two different types of exponential functions. The first function is the growth function, and that's where uh, the base value is greater than 1. And uh, that's where, obviously, by the name of the function, it's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, the decay function would be the opposite. So that's where, um, as you proceed, um, as x gets bigger, the, uh, the value of y gets smaller and smaller. Okay, And that happens when the base is anywhere between 0 and 1. Okay, so um, the exponential function, now we've added an a here. The a will be the the value that you start at. Okay, you're not always starting at 1. Sometimes you're starting at a higher or lower value. Um, um, and you use the graph to solve problems involving growth and decay. And f of x is the final amount, or what you end up at. a is the beginning amount, or the initial amount, initial number. Um, now this is very important. Um, in order to know what the b value is for the situation, a lot of times you're not given it in the word description. You're not saying b equals, you know, 2.2. You just, you're, you're either told the growth rate or the decay rate. Okay, so that's very important to be able to create your b value properly. If the, if the um, function is growing and you're given a growth rate, well, the value of b is 1 plus the growth rate. So if the growth rate was 5%, well, 5% is 0 0.05 as a, as a decimal. So b would be 1 plus 0 0.05 or 1.05. If the, if the function is decaying, getting smaller, uh, you may be told that the decay rate is 11% over a certain period. Um, so the, what you do with the decay rate, um, and I think the best way to think of this is if you're decaying 11% per year, think about how much you're keeping. So if you're, if you're losing 11% per year, that means you're keeping 89%. So that's, how, that's, that's what the rate would be, 0.89. So you're basically multiplying everything by 0.9 year after year, month after month, whatever the time period is. Um, so a very common mistake is to see that the decay rate, you know, is 11% and make b equal to 0 0.11. That would be wrong because that would actually mean you're losing, uh, you're decaying uh, at a rate of 89% for each time period. Okay, and x is the number, x is the exponent. That's how many different periods of growth or decay you have. So if you wanted to find out your value after uh, five years, your x value would be five. Okay, so we've, we've talked a little bit about some of this, just to maybe to uh, 
summarize what we just talked about. If the growth rate as a percent is given, then the base of the power in, in the equation can be obtained by adding the rate as a decimal to 1. For example, a growth rate of 8% involves multiplying repeatedly by 1.08, and that, that's what your base would be, 1.08. If the decay rate as a percent is given, then the base of the power in the equation can be obtained by subtracting the rate as a decimal from 1. Okay, so for example, a decay rate of 8% means you're keeping 92%, and that means your, your base is 0.92, means you're continually multiplying by 0.92. Okay, that's, and because it's less than 1, it means it's getting smaller every time you multiply by the base. Um, and one way to tell the difference between growth and decay is to consider whether the quantity is increasing or decreasing. So that should be pretty obvious, but sometimes people get uh, mixed up a bit and they'll make something that's growing into, uh, uh, they'll give it a base that's less than one, which would obviously be decaying. Uh, this is a very important point and you'll see it in the examples we do today. Uh, you have to make sure that you've got the correct units. So the units for the growth decay rate and the number of growth or decay periods must be the same. So that's, a, that's an extremely common mistake, is to not really checking that you're working with the same units. So if you're not, that means you'll have to change one of them into the other units. Okay, so let's try a few of these out. Um, I think we have three examples we're gonna do today. Um, and this is a pretty common one. Uh, Radioactive decay is a very common exponential word question. So, uh, and that's based around the fact that uh, radioactive materials have a half-life, which means every half-life period of time, it loses half of its radio radioactive material. Um, so, a 200 gram sample, of, now a lot of the words here don't really matter, so filter out what you need and what you don't need. A 200 gram sample of radioactive polonium-210 has a half-life of 138 days. That means every 138 days it loses half of its radioactivity. Um, well, basically that's what they say. The amount of polonium left in a sample is half the original amount and that keeps going. Every 138 days you lose another half of what you just had. Okay, and they've actually got the formula here for you. Mass of polonium in grams that remain after T days can be modeled by uh, M of T. So M of T is the mass of radioactivity, and that's going to be in grams, because it says here, um, is equal to 200 uh, times 1 half to the power T over 138. Okay, so that's a little confusing. Let's see where those numbers came from. So M of T is your final result of mass based on how many how much time has passed that's what you're calculating the 200 is the initial amount of radioactivity radioactive material 200 okay and one half that's because we're working with half life so we're going to be continually multiplying by a half uh, every every half life every 138 days we multiply by another half okay now the exponent's a bit strange for this case. So it's T over 138. So a lot of people would say, well, why don't we just put T there? Well, if I put T there and I wanted to find the amount of radioactivity after, say, uh, 20 days, well, that would actually be multiplying over and over by a half 20 times, and that's not what we want. We want to only do that every 138 days. So that's why you have a fraction here. So the actual half-life of the material is in the denominator, um, and the actual number of days that have passed is in the numerator. And that makes sense because, say you wanted to find the, um, the amount of radioactive material after 138 days, well, T would be 138, but when you divide that by 138, you get 1. And that's exactly what it should be, uh, because you only want to multiply the original amount of radioactive material, the 200, by a half once. Okay, if it's if this was 276 days for T, well, divide by 138, you get 2, and that's because that's how many times, 
how many half lives do we have? And that, in that case, it would be, you know, uh, 276 divided by 138 is 2. So in a lot of cases, you will not have, you know, a nice integer result here. And that's, you're going to have to do it uh, using a calculator, most of these questions. And that's, that's fine. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense with the equation now. Um, so let's let's get down to some work. Um, so I'm going to circle some of the data. Well, determine the mass that remains after five years. Okay, and here's our first issue because uh, the half-life is given in days. The equation T works in days, but we were just asked about five years. Okay, so the first thing we have to do it's going to be a lot easier to convert years uh, into days and then just use that as our t value than change the whole equation to work in years. That would be a monumental task. So uh, we basically say 5 years is equal to 5 times 365 days. That's approximate because there probably is at least one leap year in there. Uh, but we're going to go with just a constant number of days in a year. So 1825 days. Um, so that's our that's going to be our t value. Okay, so I want to calculate the amount of mass after five years or after 18 1825 days. So I'm going to plug in uh, 1825 here and then I go to the equation and write everything as it is, except I'm going to plug in the actual value of t, which is 1825 divided by 138. Now, I won't actually do that value, but, you know, it looks like it's, well, I would guess it's about 15 half-life periods. Um, but you weren't really asked for that. You can just do this calculation at once. Now, again, don't make the mistake of saying, oh, 200 times a half, that's 100. And then I'll use the exponent here. That would be totally wrong um, because bed mass says we have to do exponents first. And the exponent is only working on the 1 half, not, not the 200. Or not, and not the, certainly not the 200 times a half. So when you plug this into a calculator, we're going to get 0 0.021 grams. And, uh, you know, that's a pretty small amount. If you want to be, if you want to be a little more uh, impressive scientifically, we could turn this into milligrams. So a milligram is basically a, th a thousand grams. So I'd multiply this by a thousand and I get 21 milligrams like that. Okay. So therefore, and always put a word answer, okay? It's a word question. It deserves a word answer. After five years, uh, 21 milligrams of radioactive material remains. Okay, you notice I changed it back to five years in my word answer, even though I used days in my... Uh, calculation because the question asked how much remains after five years so I want to answer the question the way it was asked. Okay uh, the second part it kind of working the other way so instead of saying here's here's how much time has passed five years how much radioactive material is left at that time now we're saying how how much time does it take for the original sample of 200 grams to decay to 110 grams. So now we're looking for a value for T uh, based on, you know, M of T. So in this situation, the final amount that's remaining, they, they told us it's 110 grams. So that's the given. And then the rest of the question is as it was. Okay, and the first thing we always do is when we're trying to simplify this equation, we, we're trying to get T by itself. Um, and the one thing we definitely can do is take that initial value and divide both sides by it. So when I do that to both sides, I get 0 0.55 equals 
Um, and the one half, I'll just change to 0.5 just to make it more calculator friendly. Uh, and then the exponent is t over 138. All right, now we're at a crossroads here because where do we go from here? You can't really just plug this into a calculator and get the answer like we did with the part A. Um, now, according to the grade nine curriculum, um, we're supposed to be teaching you that you should be using guess and check. Uh, what, that, what I mean by that is, let's just keep trying different values of t um, until we get this side equal, well, very close to 0.55. And that is a very cumbersome, tedious process. Okay, now the good news is, uh, well, let me let me just write what I was getting to. There's actually two ways uh, to solve for t. Okay, the first way, like I just said, that's guess and check. So the way that works, like I just said, uh, maybe we try, I don't know, t equals 100. We try that and, uh, oh, maybe that's too low. It's it gives us something below 0.55. So then we say, okay, let's try t equal 200. Okay, plug that in, get the answer here. That's higher than this. So it's like divide and conquer. The next, maybe you try is 150. And you just kind of eventually, after maybe 10 or 15 calculations, you get an answer that equals that. It's very time consuming. Um, the good news is, in grade 12, you will be learning about something called logarithms. And you might recognize that from the button on your calculator, log. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to teach you logarithms, but I'll teach you a shortcut uh, that will help you get this using your calculator in about 10 seconds. So that's obviously a more efficient use of your time. So the way the logarithms work, logarithms are basically like the inverse operation of e exponents. Okay, so if I have an equation, y equals b to the x, let me move over a bit, okay, and I wanna, I'm trying to solve for the exponent. Well, that's a tough task. And like I said, the only way that you're supposed to know how to do that is just try some numbers until you get one that, that works, guess and check. Now, uh, the way logs work, I can actually get an equation for x equals, which is what I want, and that equation, involves taking the logarithms or logs of the y and the b value that you've got in your equation. So it actually equals log of y over log of b. So there's, you know, there's your shortcut for this process. Um, so that's what we'll try here. So right now if I look over here and I compare you know, this, that looks like my 0.55 is my y, my base is 0.5, my b. So I know my y and my, my b, my x is actually this fraction here, because the, the exponent is a fraction. So when I, when I convert this equation, sorry, this equation to something like that, it look, looks like the exponent, t over 138, is equal to the log of y, so remember the y is the left side of the equation, so log of 0.55 over the log of the base, which in our case is 0.5. Okay, and there's a button on your calculator. It might just say log, or it might say log with a little 10 under it, uh, log base 10. Um, so that's that's the button you would use. So you'd basically take the log of 0.55 and divide that by the log of 0.5. Okay, now we've got this 138 that's, you know, kind of in the way of our solution. So I can actually, you know, if I want to uh, solve for t, I would multiply both sides by 138. So the top of the top of this, I multiply by 138. Okay, and at this point I could basically enter that into a calculator and I will get 119 if I round to the nearest decimal. Sorry, not round to the nearest integer. So therefore, it will take 119 days 
uh, for the sample to decay to 110 grams. Okay, and if you're not sure about how, if you if you got the right answer, you can always take uh, the 119 that we got here, and if you plug it into your T value and just calculate what, what the right side is, well, that should give you something very, very close to 110. Okay, so you can always check if you're not sure about did I do that correctly or not. Um, so if I go back here, I forgot to put in my second method, and that second method was use logarithms. Okay, so this is uh, this is what I did over here. So that's a nice handy tool uh, if you're trying to solve for an exponent in an exponential equation. If you're trying to solve for anything else, you don't need to use logarithms. It's just when you're asked to find either the whole exponent or part of it, as this was the case here. Okay, so start off with a fairly complicated example. Um, this one isn't as bad, but it's kind of instead of them giving us the equation right off the bat, which is nice, uh, in this example too, they're just giving us a table of values. They're saying uh, a biologist tracks the population of a new species of frogs over several years. Uh, from the table of values, determine the equation that models the frog population growth and determine the frog population after 12 years. <coughs> okay. So we want our equation to look something like what we've talked about, a y equals a times b um, to the power x. Okay, now the a value is pretty straightforward. That's that's the initial value. So uh, we, we get that right off the bat. So the value at the time of zero, that's going to be initial value. And our initial value will be the a in our equation. So we've already got half of what we need. Uh, the second, the B is a little harder because we're trying to figure out what is the number we, what is the growth rate of the uh, frog population. And just looking at it, you can see it's increasing. So the base, the value of B is definitely greater than one because it's growing. And uh, how do we figure out what that value is? Well, this is where you compare. You went from four 400 in year 0 to 480 in year 1, at the end of year 1. Um, so um, we, what we do is we take the ratio. So we do um, 480 divided by 400, and that will tell us our growth rate. And when we do this, we get it's exactly 1.2. So 400 times 1.2 gives us 480. So we're looking for that multiplier between each year to see, um, you know, and maybe they're all the same, maybe they're different, we don't know at this point. But when you actually do, for example, the next one, four, 576 over 480, you get something extremely close, if not exactly 1.2, like say example, maybe 1.2001 or 1.1992. So very, very close to 1.2 and it turns out they're all like that. If they're not exactly 1.2, they're extremely close. Okay, and if they're extremely close to the other values that are exactly 1.2, well, you know, we, we can see the pattern here. Even if one of these numbers was a little bit maybe 1.18, uh, we could see overall the trend seems to be growing by, in this case it could be growing by 20%, the 0.2. Um, the one part is basically saying we're keeping the original amount and we're adding another 20%. So um, the growth rate is 20% each year. So that is actually our B value. So if we get a consistent uh, ratio or multiplier, uh, that, be, that is our B value. So we can come up with a, um, a formula for this, an equation. And I want to make it meaningful, so because we're measuring population, I'm going to call the function p for population, and it's measuring based on time. Time is a number of years. Okay, and we've, we've already got our a value, so it's going to be 400. 
and then our our b value we just got through this process we just did so that's 1.2 and then it's to the power of t okay and they want once we've got the equation they said determine equation that models the frogs uh, population after 12 years so we'll just plug in 12 for t because remember uh, this t is measured in years and they've asked the question in years so make sure you check because maybe they, they could ask you what's the frog population after 18 months okay so that's not 18 years if you put 18 years that's what you if you put 18 for t that's what you're finding population after 18 years so if it was 18 months you 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 know take 18 divided by 12 18 months is 1.5 years you'd use 1.5 so be careful of that uh, so that's 400 times 1.2 to the power of 12 so I haven't done that yet let me do it now so 1.2 to the power 12 double check okay and then times 400 okay so and when I actually get a, a number here um, so I get that that value is 3566.4 now it's very important you realize what you're actually counting here we're counting the number of frogs okay so these are living things you can't have 0.4 of a frog you can have 0.9 of a frog um, so uh, whatever our number is in the calculator we round down okay even if it was 3566.9 okay normally you'd round up to 3567 but in this case 0.9 of a frog isn't a frog so you'd always round down for any living things like people or bacteria or frogs okay so uh, I might as well say up here, so P is population to define what we just used here, and uh, T is time in years. Okay, so this would be number of frogs, so therefore, after 12 years, there would be 3566 3566 frogs okay so that's how that works don't put don't put point uh, part of a frog you can't do that okay so that's how we do it if you're given a table of values um, just find the ratio as you're changing and you can see the first thing you look for is is it going up or down okay if it's going up you know the b value is bigger than one if you know it's going down you know your b value is between zero and one Okay, last question here. Uh, this is a much more straightforward question. Um, so we're going to find the value of a car after so many years. So a new car costs $24,000. It loses 18% of its value each year after it's purchased. This is called depreciation. Um, determine the value of the car after 30 months. Okay, so a few numbers here that are, stick out. The 24000 well, that's the initial value of the car, a new car. When you when you buy it, it's worth $24,000. A year later, it's not worth that much. And it actually loses 18% per year. So each year. Um, and then the question is, determine the value of the car after 30 months. Well, here we have that situation about units again because we're going to be building our equation based on losing 18% per year. So the, the time that I'm going to give, the value of t that I give my equation will be the number of years. So I have to convert this into years. So divide by 12, because there's 12 months in a year, and I get 2.5 years. So it's easy to overlook that. You'll find that you're going to get some hugely small value if you plugged in 30 
because it'd be finding the value of the car after 30 years, which would be almost nothing. Okay, so in terms of my values, I just figured out, well, the 24,000, that's the initial value. That's my B value. Sorry, my A value. My B value, now remember, it's losing 18%. So don't make that mistake of saying, oh, that means B is 0 0.18. No, it's losing that much. It's actually keeping 100% minus what we're losing. So it's keeping 82%. So you have to do the one minus when when you've given a a decay or a depreciation rate. So our B value is actually one minus 0 0.18, which is 0 0.82, or 82 percent. Okay. So now we can do our equation. I'll put I'll call it V for value, based on the time, and the time will be measured in years. So that's my A value, the initial value, 24,000, and then Here's my base, 0.82, and that's to the power of t. So, so the v is v equals value in dollars, and t equals time in years. So make sure you write that down if you're creating your own equation, uh, not just for the teacher's sake, but for yours when you actually start. If you wrote down time and years and then you went back to this, you might you might catch your mistake of putting in a 30 here before it's too late. So if we want to know the value after two and a half years or 30 months, uh, we plug in t equals 2.5 and then put uh, change our exponent to 2.5. And obviously you have to use your calculator for this. And that would be... 14613. Now, you might ask, well, you know, how many decimals do I put here? Well, the value's in dollars, right? So I would say, well, you know, the price can, can be, you know, contain cents. So I would always put like two decimal places after the, after the number of dollars here. So that would round to 22 cents. So wrap it up with a word answer. Therefore, the value of the car is 14,613. So I put my units here now. Here I don't, in the calculation, I don't put units, but it's important to, in your word answer, after 30 months. And I'm putting 30 months again, just like the previous example, because that's what the question is asking. If you want to put in brackets 2.5 years, that's fine. Okay, so that's uh, this one. We actually had to create the equation and solve, uh, ask the question using the equation. Um, so we've seen three different types of problems. They're all fairly common ways of asking um, application questions involving uh, exponential functions. So there's uh, some attached homework here. I'd like you to give it a try. Make sure that uh, you're able to do the things that we just uh, demonstrated with these three examples. Okay, so that'll be it for this lesson, and it ends the exponential functions unit. So until the next lesson, have a great day.